Welcome back. Now, sometime in 2002, in Meduguri, Borno State, the name Mohammed Yusuf and the birth of Boko Haram, uh, the Boko Haram group, became what has now turned out to be more than two decades of blood, tears, and anguish in Nigeria, but mostly in northern Nigeria. At first, it seemed like a joke, or at least, you know, something really strange that will not survive more than a month because, I mean, no. This isn't a Nigerian thing. That's what we thought back then. This isn't, it's not a thing that we're familiar with or even could imagine would be possible in our great nation. Nobody imagined. What are you talking about? Terrorist organizations in Nigeria? No. But yes, Nigerians, of course, you know, over time have had tribal issues, communal issues, armed robbery and the likes. But terrorism? No. <laughs> That's not something that could be real here. Well, so we thought. Unfortunately, just never went away and over time grew into a hydra-headed monster. Over time, of course, it has morphed into not just Boko Haram, but, you know, ISWAP. Bandits, unknown gunmen, kidnapping and whatnot. Nigerians would have never imagined the possibility of suicide bombs becoming a reality. Nigerians strapping bombs to themselves and blowing themselves up. That can't be real. We, I mean, the, the, the understanding is that we love life too much. And so, no, nobody's trying to strap a bomb to themselves and blow themselves up in Nigeria. No. But sadly, of course, you know, it became reality. And of course, with back-to-back -back bomb attacks in, in, in uh, Abuja and different parts of North, northern Nigeria, in churches, in mosques, and in public places, it became the norm. Now, from bombs, you know, to attacks on communities, to villages being wiped out, to local governments being held and even run by terror groups, we even then were no longer able to identify those responsible for these atrocities, and the government just named them bandits or known gunmen. Over time, the nation has lost count of how many victims have been affected, either being killed in the most gruesome way, or displaced, or kidnapped to never be seen again, or simply just disappeared. A UN report in 2021 puts the figure of those killed directly or indirectly at 350,000 people. Reuters also, in a report also by the United Nations, shared this. Similar figures, about 350,000 people that have been affected or um, indirectly or directly by the Boko Haram, killed mostly uh, by Boko Haram and of course the insurgency. Another um, um, report by Human Angle states here that 25,000 people would have been declared missing and some of these people would almost never be seen again. There is a never-ending list of reports of attacks in northern and middle belt Nigeria showing thousands and thousands who have been affected by the endless killing of Nigerian citizens and also the thousands of Nigerian soldiers who have lost their lives fighting this cancer. Over time, we've spoken back to back and over and over and over and over about how the government needs to do better with fighting this insurgency and you know, you know, fixing Nigeria's insecurity challenges. We've spoken about it so many times. We've made demands from the government a million times. But there's something we almost have never spoken about and we maybe will never be able to catch our breaths long enough to speak about. And that is the trauma that Northern Nigeria has endured for the last two decades. From the families who have been wiped out, brothers, sisters, Mothers and fathers, uncles, who have watched their families being murdered, but are still alive till this day with that trauma living with them forever. Just take a moment this morning, all right? And imagine the pain your fellow citizens have suffered. It's a pain that you may never be able to understand because, you know, maybe you've just never been affected by it directly. But these people have seen death face to face for years in the most horrific way. You would almost never be able to imagine what their realities have been over the last two decades, staring death in the face, you know, in this way. This morning's monologue is dedicated to those who may never heal, those who have had their lives torn to tiny shreds and would almost never be the same again. To the families of Nigerian soldiers who, have, who will never see their brother or father again, to those who still have nightmares regularly in the middle of the night, Think about how unfair it is that there are millions of people who one day had a home somewhere in Borno State or in Katsina or Nasara or somewhere in Zamfara State. They were living normal lives. But then suddenly life changed and they've spent the last couple of years 
living in IDP camps, just surviving. And I asked this morning, when will we catch a breath? When will Nigeria be at peace long enough as a nation to start to heal? To all of those people this morning living in IDP camps, survivors of this insurgency, victims of, you know, seeming failure of government, I'm sending you a hug. And I hope that you understand that it's not your fault. It wasn't meant to be this way, you know, that you lose your father, you know, either of your parents or siblings in such a terrible way. Today, I choose to not speak on how much the Nigerian government has failed its citizens and, you know, has a huge share in the blame for the loss of all these lives. I'd rather use this moment to remind us of all these ones who have been victims of the insurgency in northern Nigeria. There have been multiple, um, you know, independent uh, reports and documentaries that have been done showing the, the, the carnage and the victims of these things in, in, in southern Kadunao, in different parts of northern Nigeria and the Middle Belt. We hope that someday we'll achieve peace again, and then some true healing can happen. That's it for Which Way Nigeria today.